For those I don't know, I'm Dana Compton from the American Society of Civil Engineers. Very excited to be involved in this day and particularly to moderate this panel, Views from the Field, Enhancing and Assessing Societal Impacts. Um, going to introduce each of our speakers briefly. We have Judy Ruttenberg, who is Senior Director, Scholarship and Policy at the Association of Research Libraries. Uh, Casey Redd, who is Associate Vice President of Research and STEM Education at the Association of Public Land Grant Universities. And Nikita Lab Ladd, who recently earned her PhD in Environmental Science and Policy from George Mason University. Congrats on that achievement. Um, so in this session, our speakers are going to speak uh, briefly, about five minutes each, um, about the state of, so of societal impact outside the publishing arena um, and covering what efforts are being undertaken in other sectors, um, such as libraries, higher ed, and institutions. Just go ahead and hand it straight over to you, Judy. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dana. And it's also, it's nice to meet the panelists in person. <laughs> it's really nice to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, so yes, my name is Judy. I represent the Association of Research Libraries as its Senior Director of Scholarship and Policy. I've been with the association about 12 years in a variety of roles. Um, so who and, who and what is ARL? Some of you may be familiar with our organization. We have 127 members. Um, mostly large academic R1 university libraries, but we also have two large public libraries and um, uh, several federal governmental libraries. So uh, ARL's vision is a trusted, equitable, and inclusive um, knowledge ecosystem, and our mission to achieve that vision is to empower and advocate on behalf of research libraries to shape and influence the policy and research environment. So, uh, and you can see our values there. So you can, in my corner of the association, um, I lead the, a team called Scholarship and Policy, and one corner of that is Scholars and Scholarship. Um, we really work to bridge policy and practice. Um, so uh, particular policy germane to this discussion, social impact in this day, um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on making federally funded research publicly accessible, so public access um, policies. But those policies to, to uh, the you know, OSTP memo, the Nelson memo of 2022, not just to make research publicly accessible, but to really, that another piece of that memo is really to engage the public in um, the federal scientific enterprise, um, which I think is um, explicitly understood to be an exercise in building public trust. Um, we, uh, in this, in the association, we like to say we work at the intersection of libraries and their parent institutions, public policy, and the research community. So this is another place where public access and, and this kind and social impact sort of work resides. So I'm going to talk about two areas of work that um, the association has undertaken recently, both of which really was launched under um, the Scholars and Scholarship Committee while Elaine Westbrooks was chair. So thanks, Elaine, <laughs> for being, being such an important leader in our community. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, something that we sort of came into, I think, slowly and organically, and another that we really sort of took on very intentionally. So um, ARL and its member libraries um, have, I think, long been leaders in uh, accelerating open research open and open access to scholarship. And open scholarship, open science, as you know, has a kind of broad array of value propositions. Um, access and affordability, rigor and reproducibility, accountability of public investment, um, but also innovation, right? We like to say that, you know, the more open research is, the more we increase the chances that the right information gets to the right people and they can do something with it, and that it makes an impact. So I think while libraries are strongly associated with open access and those, those kind of high level or abstract goals, we have been less visible in um, and potentially less aware of community engaged scholarship. So it's sort of like, will the right information, re you know, community engaged, which is a much more sort of on the ground um, partnership with communities. So in 21, 22, we ran a pilot cohort um, of eight member institutions who wanted to do some, who understood open scholarship, accelerating open scholarship to be in their strategic interest. And 201, they were 
motivated to do that because they wanted to increase the public impact of their institution's research. So we called the initiative ACER, accelerating the social impact of research. And we found this intersection of kind of open access and community engagement, both generative and fascinating. Um, researchers in both, in who sort of, in both of these modes of scholarship, open, open and community engaged, are often motivated by increasing reach and impact and democratizing knowledge uh, production outside the academy. And both groups of scholars kind of face challenges with institutional support and rewards for this kind of work. And um, we believe the increased visibility for research libraries at this convergence represents an opportunity for institutional leadership. So as a preview, I'm just a giant fan of some of the work that Casey's gonna talk about of APLU um, under this kind of rubric of modernizing scholarship. But I won't preempt that. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I presented this work at Campus Compact, um, which is the sort of you know professional organization of community engagement professionals on campuses, hoping to just you know again kind of network together people who are involved in this sort of work. And just as a side note, with respect to the last presentation, this is a group that does not get enough visibility for the bridging and like the day-to-day -day bridging and dialogue work that they're doing on campuses at a time when the only thing that's in the headlines is like super crisis level, you know, co contention. So just a little shout out to, to the community engagement folks um, for doing that work. So the kinds of projects that we highlighted in our cohort were, um, so University of Illinois, Chicago, really gearing up for NIH's public act, pub, uh, data management and sharing plan, lots, lots more public data available, um, working with campus and community health centers to make sure that the community had access to that data when it came out. Um, at the University of Virginia, um, building capacity among community groups to collect data that they could use um, in analysis of inequality. That it was an equity atlas, they called it. Um, and they had a, it was a library and their school of data science. Um, and at North Carolina State, uh, their library's open knowledge center that worked with researchers on sort of public facing output. So I, now I'm really thinking about this lay translation issue, but really the kinds of, um, the kinds of, you know, other than the journal article outputs that, that people might want to engage um, the public in their research. Um, and then a, just a little bit of a shout out to Extension too. I mean, we didn't see that so much in our cohort, but we do have libraries doing really interesting work using the infrastructure of cooperative extension, like for at the University of Maryland and digital literacy. And I think it's a really, it's, I want to plus one that work. So the second thing I want to just fly over is a research project we undertook in my, um, on determining institutional and researcher costs for making research data publicly accessible. So first phase of this work recently wrapped up. It was um, funded by NSF. This is really my colleague, Cynthia Hudson Vitali's work. She's the PI on this, and she'll be here tomorrow. So if you want to find her at the conference and connect with her about it, I will do my very best to represent her brilliant work. Um, but this is really another kind of bridging policy and practice issue. We think sharing data is good public policy. Um, and we know the costs around this whole enterprise are just poorly understood. And um, they are you know, sort of distributed across institutional units, the research office, the library, research computing, in a way that, we, that is hard to see. Um, so the research, Cynthia's research undertook, and it's a big team that you can see, no, that's okay, um, uh, undertook you know, the, to collect three things, sort of expense and cost model information from institutions, including like staffing and infrastructure, what they were doing to support public access, um, and the cost incurred by campus units to support making that data public, so the curation, the cleaning, the long-term storage of data, and then the costs borne by individual researchers if they, as part of their direct costs for their grant. So, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated piece of work. I recommend the expense report and the methodology report too. I'm just gonna say what it does is, uh, why I'm excited about presenting it, is that it really sort of opens the black box of this complicated process um, and begins to get some real cost figures on the table. So, um, which can amount to, as the report found, five to 6% of a total cost of a grant um, to prepare the da data to make it publicly accessible. So non-trivial cost. Um, it begins to understand the distribution of costs, uh, you know, costs across institutional units, and sort of, and so, just as a consequence of that, surfaces opportunity for efficiency and collaboration. And it points at, and I, you know, 
with some uncertainty, points at um, cost savings and efficiency of using campus-based infrastructure, um, like the institutional repository. So lots more work to be done there, but I believe this expense report gives us something to start with, and, and the second phase of that work uh, is underway now, funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Hi, I'm Casey Red. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit first about a little bit the hats that I wear, and then what is a higher education association in case, and especially about APLU in case those in the room might not know what a higher education association is. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the work that has come out of APLU that you all might be interested in. Um, so at APLU, I'm the Associate Vice President of Research and STEM Education. I really wear three hats, and those are around improving undergraduate STEM education. Um, we have an NSF includes, NSF Eddie Bernice Johnson includes Aspire Alliance, um, which is around diversifying the professoriate. And then the third is I support the vice presidents of research who add um, at least our member institutions, which are the public research universities, really lead the research enterprise of the institution. So I think a lot about what they um, need and are discussing. And under the vice presidents of research, we've had several sets of work. One is modernizing scholarship for the public good, which uh, in public impact research, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And then the other is their interest in um, advancing public access to research data and publications. So. You know, I, I kind of bring all of those threads into, the, in, into how I think about the higher education system and the overlap in what we call public impact research. So I'll, I'll be using that shorthand um, in my remarks. I also think a lot about um, institutional change at our institutions and how to best support them in making institutional change. And then also our role in sort of the DC and the national landscape with the other kinds of organizations, associations, societies, et cetera, that think about the research and education enterprise. Um, so that's all what's swirling up here. So as far as APLU by the numbers, I put this up here to give a little bit of an insight about higher education associations. So APLU, we have about 250 members and those are the public research universities and so we have institutional membership and you can see by the things that we've highlighted in the slide what we usually talk about our members it's sort of the number of undergraduate students that are educated by our members the amount of research that we do etc um, and you for APLU Association of Public and Land Grant Universities the the main services we provide to our members are one we convene um, our membership so we have we Reg at least twice a year, we will have um, meetings of the vice presidents of research, of the provosts, of the presidents, uh, VPs of international engagement, of chief diversity officers. So we bring them together in individual meetings to talk about their issues within their part of the ecosystem. And then also we have a national meeting. So we're trusted brokers with our members. So we really think about uh, providing a, pl a place where they can come together and learn from one another. The other is we're an advocacy organization. So there is a part of APLU that lobbies on behalf of, hi of higher education, so we're doing things on the Hill. I don't do that, but there are definitely members at APLU that do that. Um, we also have regular communications with federal agencies, program officers about policies that are coming out that are gonna impact the research and education enterprise. And then the other thing that APLU does is we have sometimes externally funded projects, sometimes internally funded projects where we'll work with a subset of our members on an area of interest, similar to what um, Judy talked about with her NSF funded projects. We also have some NSF funded projects. So um, I'd also like to say in the projects that we choose, we can't get too far ahead of our members, so we really try to identify a few campuses that are kind of leading edge and we will nucleate around them to try to bring the rest of the membership along and to learn from those that are on the, on the cutting edge. So some of the work that we've done in kind of the project-based space is, as I've already mentioned, we have our work on public access to research data. This was a project that was done in collaboration with the Association of American Universities, who are like the 70 public and private uh, institutions, biggest public and private universities in the country. Did I forget to say APLU has 250? 
public research university, so I'll just put that out there. Um, and so this was uh, work in thinking about what do institutions need to do to get ready to be compliant and also to really live the spirit of making our research more publicly available. Um, and so that's one. And then we also have work on the public impact research and then more recently, the Modernizing Scholarship for the Public Good. This was led by Dr. Elise Auerbach, who's at the University of Michigan. Michigan. She was an APLU Civic Science Fellow. I mentioned the Civic Science Fellows program earlier when I was um, when I had a question. So this is uh, a program that uh, places early scholars in usually disciplinary societies and national academies associations to do a one to two year project. So this was Dr. Elise uh, Auerbach's project, which was um, putting this report together. I really encourage you to check this report out. I think the, her recommendations for institutions are really useful for this group. It, it has a lot of language around community engaged scholarship, but I would also uh, encourage you to look at the air table that is associated with this report because it has uh, a sortable database, so you can sort or filter based on presidents, provosts, faculty members, staff in like centers for public engagement, et cetera, to think about, to find tactics that you can use on campuses to advance publicly engaged scholarship. You can also look at based on like, are you thinking about promotion and tenure? Are you thinking about catalytic awards? So it also has all the research literature that backs that up. So it's just a really uh, useful resource guide for anyone who is doing work in this space. And then for the last uh, slide, I really just put this one in to remind myself how it's important to kind of define what we mean in this space as I get more and more into these conversations. I think in, depending on the disciplinary hat you wear, depending on if you have more of a global mindset or a US-based mindset, some of the language we use, we might assume we're all meaning the same thing, but we don't always mean the same thing. Like I heard sustainability today, and in my mind that meant something different than the SDG, right? So I put up here what we mean when we say public impact research. And would also like to flag, Benjamin Olnick Brown is here in the room from the Pew Charitable Trust, and we have a workshop coming up in a couple of days where we'll be kind of unpacking how you foster the PIR ecosystem, so thinking about the different sectors that are influencing researcher and institutional behavior. Uh, really, my premise would be that we can't even have e institution by institution or all the institutions move to support this kind of work if publishers, if, if researchers can't get funded, if they can't get published, if there aren't, uh, if there isn't that kind of ecosystem support to really make this happen. So uh, I'll talk about my research. Uh, I'm an environmental social scientist and I just defended on April 5th, so this is <laughs> what I did as a part of my dissertation. It was divided into three studies, and in the first one, I tried to see, uh, okay, I'll tell you what, it, what was the common point of it. It was about sustainability, literacy, culture, and behavior in higher education studies. I try, really tried to measure and model uh, how are students, undergrad students, examining the relationships between these, and what are the factors that influence students' sustainability, literacy, culture, and behavior on campus. And uh, in the first study, I tried to understand uh, what is the landscape, what are like why are universities doing these, these assessments, and how are they doing it, what are the challenges and facilitators, or what are the motivations behind doing the these, and is it really having an institutional impact? Uh, why are they engaging in these assessments, basically? Then the second one, I tried to uh, develop a model to understand student sustainability, literacy, culture, and behavior, and I tested it at three higher education institutions, one of which is an HBCU, which Dr. Ellis told us in the morning, uh, and, and uh, one is an R1 university, a very high research impact university, and last one is a community college. So the importance of this is that there is, like studies are being mostly done at R1 institutions or universities, uh, four-year universities, but data, we have data from a community college and an HBCU. And lastly, collating it all together and uh, telling what are the factors that influence sustainability, literacy, culture, and behavior. So going into the first study of what is the landscape? Why are students, like why are universities conducting SLAC assessments? So SLAC is sustainability, literacy, and culture assessments. From the first graph, you will you'll see that the challenges mostly faced are that it's not a priority. Most of the uh, university administrators are facing that it's not an institutional priority. So why do we conduct like these surveys and uh, tax the students more on taking more surveys? Already they are 
they're taking a lot. Uh, then there are survey difficulties, like getting, getting answers from a survey or understanding what factors impact students' behavior through a survey is really difficult. Then institutional barriers. We spoke about bureaucracy in the morning. So that's, that's a topic that you all know. Uh, then there are lacking resources, like there's not a certain, like a, a, an office dedicated to do these assessments or understand, like an office that is really interested in understanding what factors inf influence student behaviors and, uh, or like fa there is not an incentive to do this. Then there is inadequate methodology, like somewhat along surveys, like surveys are difficult uh, to engage what, is, what, are the, what are the factors that influence students' behaviors. So these were the challenges that I observed. In terms of facilitators or like why university is doing this, like or what facilitates them in doing this, it's more of a dedicated office to do to engage in these assessments. If they have the institutional support and incentives to do it, then that's what helps in engaging in these assessments. On, this, on the right hand side, uh, it's more of uh, where is this data going or uh, what do they use this data for? So mostly they use it for, uh, uh, in terms of like for their management and understanding students, uh, like what are the initiatives that they need to do on campus. It, it really influences those decisions. And then the other thing is, uh, it, it's used by the sustainability staff and STARS. So STARS is something called the Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System. It's done, uh, it's by the Association of Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. It's called ASHI, uh, which is something similar to Times Higher Ed, uh, and it's, ASHI is more for, uh, North American based, it is international as well. But they also have, they have this STARS program, wherein uh, all universe, most of the universities in the US uh, submit their, sustainability initiatives and programs and they are rated on on the basis of that so uh, universities can be ranked ranked as a stars platinum organization or a gold organization and basically universities use this to uh, advertise and market themselves as a sustainability organization as well as influence their programming related to it so the use of this data is mostly for institutional change like uh, we'll go over examples of what what i heard from the universities uh, so my study, I, I uh, interviewed 20 people from uh, R1 universities and most of which were uh, VPs and provosts or, or sustainability office man like managers uh, or director of sustainability and this is what I heard from them mostly. And uh, one more thing is this study was based on organizational learning. So the, on, the, on the two ends of the slide you see high organizational learning and low organizational learning. So this is a difference that I found like those that have the institutional backing and managerial commitment or uh, incentives to do these assessments, like th th that was the major difference between them. Like uh, I saw that uh, the challenges faced by them were like they, they knew that it had to be short and uh, how much of it is well-rounded in a theory assessment. So that was what the high organization learning said. Um, and then they also said like, it's so difficult to get a representative sample or like we, we, we heard about it from the keynote speaker before this that uh, really engaging in what the public wants. So a question that I would ask is uh, how are we defining that public? Like are we really getting a representative sample of all the publics or like uh, are they all involved in, in your study? So that's a question that's always needed to be asked during assessments. Um, so these are the challenges and facilitators. And then in terms of uh, examples of dissemination or data usage, I saw that like the assistant to the provost uh, for sustainability initiatives would like to see the result. Or mostly it's like the sustainability staff that's looking for this data. And at times it has also led to a full-time position for engaging in the, like for building these assessments and really, re really doing it nicely to like, so that you have a position totally dedicated to it. Um, and at the same time, it's for the low organization learning, it's, I've seen that it's, they say it's difficult like, to understand whether it's really going to have an impact on these programs, even if they have, like, they don't have the resources to do all of this. So it's, uh, it's difficult to balance the pros and cons of everything. So, yeah, and then overall in the last study, like, uh, collating it all together and trying, 
I, I tried to develop a theoretical model uh, to understand what are the factors that influence these assessments. And one finding from the first study was that there is not an existing uh, model or not, not something that is backed in research. So uh, there was a need for an assessment like that has scientific background. So uh, I developed this model and like this model only has what are my findings. So basically what I found is time spent on campus has an impact on sustainability behavior. So basically what how much time students are spending on campus or what are the initiatives that are happening on campus, such as uh, I looked at informal programs, so extracurricular programming. Like most, mostly universities focus on formal programming, like sustainability courses or green curriculum. But what I saw is extracurricular programming is really effective. Uh, and this is data from the R1 University and a community college. Uh, the HPCU did not do the entire survey, and that brings back to the point of lack of resources at that university, or uh, the you know, uh, students willing to take up such a long survey. So that's another thing. Um, so these are look like what I found overall here is in in terms of in the first block is that the more the time students spend on campus uh, and the participation in extracurricular programs, that has an impact on behavior. And apart from that, nature social connectedness. So this is something that has not been studied in most, like in previous studies, but the more green on, green you see on campus, or they are uh, not only on campus or somewhere else as well, but their connection to nature really impacts behavior, as well as the social norms. So what, what are the people around them talking about? So that, that impacts as well. One thing that to be noted is I also looked at attitudes. So sustainability, it's like, for long in the literature, it's seen that sustainability attitudes has an impact on behavior. But I, I don't know why, like in my study, I, I found that it does not have, or it, it has a negative relation to behavior. And that's a reason that uh, most studies need to be done in this case. And um, to quickly go over this middle circle, so that's, that's about how I define literacy in terms of like, it's not only about the knowledge that you have of your socio-ecological systems. I'm trying to say that there is systems thinking that comes into picture. You need to see with a broader view of not, not just of one domain, but of how the entire system is working as a whole. And as well as science of science is more of understanding of science, like the basics of science. So I, I'm saying that this, all these three define literacy and uh, it, it was it had a very less impact on behavior. So basically, this is this is known as the knowledge deficit model, wherein you say like not necessarily if you have the knowledge of a of a topic, you will engage in that behavior, and that's that's seen in most of the studies now. There are other factors like these that impact your behavior. Lastly, uh, so I'll, I'll conclude by saying that this is the so this is uh, a result of well, like this slide shows us the significant variability among all of the construct indicators across the institutions and it highlights the diverse landscape so as you can see like the these are the three institutions and their responses to for example how how often have they turned off lights in an empty room and this highlights the diverse landscape for student sustainability engagement like this is a a, a wide audience and uh, and it shows the variability in the data. So that's why I would say like, not every research is robust, so, and the scales are not robust. That's why more research is needed in testing and development of robust scales so that we can capture this behavior construct across a wide variety of audience. And uh, lastly, um, I'd like to say that I've, like a part, so I'm a part of George Mason University where I conducted this research, um, but I'm also an SDG Publishers Compact Fellow that we spoke in the morning, and I've I've been involved in the science policy space uh, with the National Science Policy Network. So it's an early career network of researchers and scientists who are who wanted to, who want to go into science policy, like really trying to see the impact, like or extend their research into policy, like Andrew said in the morning, where he, he came from the other way, like from policy to publishing, but there are researchers like me who want to influence policy as well. So uh, I can talk about that later with anyone, or, 
are involved in the like there are state policy fellowships wherein you are like I was placed at the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, uh, wherein we worked with uh, provosts and vice presidents to understand like what is the landscape of basic research and uh, what's the need for applied research or what do the uh, universities in Virginia need for applied research. So uh, I'd be happy to talk about any of these experiences. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So I um, tasked my wonderful panelists with giving me some feeder questions to get our discussion started. So thank you, everybody. I do want to start with um, maybe some things that you could say about the challenges that are facing you in each of your sectors, whether from the librarian perspective, higher ed broadly, in terms of institutions, or particularly, Nikita, for you as an early career researcher. What are your key challenges, and what could the other sectors do to best help you get beyond those challenges? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, broadly, and I don't know that this other sectors, uh, I don't know how much you can help, but uh, broadly, I think that funding is a huge challenge. Um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, it's not uniform across the 127 of my li member libraries, but, um, you know, looking at a lot of flat budgets and in an inflationary environment, et cetera. And also, but, but also looking at, um, really, you know, deploying services to, uh, increasing amount of services to address, um, you know, these issues around engagement and making data publicly accessible and open access and all of, you know, there, this is, um, you know, willingly undertaken and enthusiastically undertaken as partners in the research enterprise, but the budgets are the, I think, the uh, challenge, yeah. So I'm pulling from a framing paper um, that we are, using for our workshop in two days. And so I want to acknowledge my co-authors who are Benjamin Olnick Brown and Jessica Bennett at APLU. And so uh, in thinking about some of the challenges more from the higher education kind of um, lens is a lot of these, when we talk about societally impactful work, often these are what we might call wicked problems. And so they don't necessarily fit neatly within any discipline, a department, or funding opportunity. And so it can make multi-sector collaborations difficult, right? We have, we're really siloed in a lot of the ways that we do our work and are recognized or within those silos. Uh, it's also, um, Traditional funding structures and review processes often map poorly onto these multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary approaches. Um, they don't, there aren't as many opportunities or funding opportunities for research practice uh, partnerships or other PIR approaches. And so we really need innovative grant making practices, but that's not for the publishers, that's more for the funders. I'm looking at you, Benjamin. And then um, also a lot of that we hear from our, um, from vice presidents of research is, as we move to other kinds of impacts that aren't necessarily uh, impact factor or the number of grants, how do we assess quality in these longer timed horizon kind of work and use more qualitative impacts? What does that look like? How do we get consensus around um, which impact, which, what measurements and metrics and criteria we're using as we think about how that impacts promotion and tenure for faculty. These are really high stakes for researchers, right? And how do we get consensus around what quality looks like both in the scholar, in the scholarship, but also in thinking about scholarly productivity for the individual researchers in these spaces. Um, and then related to that is just the current academic incentive structures, especially at R1 institutions often disincentivize publicly engaged scholarship. It creates challenges for building then a robust pipeline of researchers into this work, um, and which particularly affects minoritized scholars who may be more drawn to doing more PIR work. So there's a lot of entrenched structures that we really, if we're going to make any kind of progress, we need to think about it in an ecosystem's way and kind of all move together to start to shift these systems of incentives, um, resourcing, etc. That's you. You summarized it well. Um, so yeah, that's. Uh, I I would say like mine is an example of what of the challenges that you face. So basically, like uh, of collaborating with other universities and researchers or who are interested in doing this research. Or sustainability is known as a wicked problem, honestly. So yeah, getting collaborators and funding for is is a challenge. Are there bright spots that you would want to highlight for the audience? 
I mean, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of great work that's happening out there. Um, and we have some case studies in the modernizing scholarship for the public good that you can look at um, that are, um, I think Elise did a really good job of trying to find programs that were more than just one off, but had an op had um, an opportunity or possibility or were being institutionalized at the institution. So I think those are worth looking at. But I think once again, it comes back to how do we build a system that doesn't require individually really engaged people or projects to make this happen, but the ways that we put structures in place to lower the barriers so more researchers and institutions and communities can engage in this work. So, but Modernizing Scholarship for the Public Good has some, has some examples. <laughs> I'd like to say that the bright spot for in my way was that this, uh, like we, we funded, a, we submitted an NS, NSF proposal for this research because like we saw that it was needed in the universities, but it wasn't uh, approved because they, they thought they, they wanted to see like an existing network, like a model and everything was built. They were looking at, at it more from an evaluator side rather than a researcher side. So the bright spot for me was it led to my dissertation. So I was able to give it to them. Yeah, I mean, I think the bright spot is um, the opportunity of sort of across the sector for making these kinds of shared interests and activities more visible. So, I mean, I think this, you know, for us, it was, a, as in libraries, it was a big bright spot. I mean, I really, honestly, I felt like when we started to dig into the public impact research and community engagement in, uh, research, I felt like I just entered this parallel universe to the one that I had occupied, like thinking about you know, open access and thinking about sort of institutional challenges and here was this and DEI and all, all these kinds of issues around research and here was this whole other sort of conversation. And so um, that would benefit from um, infrastructure that libraries have, from advocacy around open access, from, you know, from all kinds of things. And then absolutely vice versa. I mean, just the, you know, um, that libraries who are, you know, looking at new kinds of paradigms for engaging with communities and new kinds of collecting and, um, you know, new relationships there can learn so much from that sort of existing engaged research. So I think the, op the bright spot is um, trying to find, you know, is, is bringing a conversation together across the sector and, and you know, and, and working on, and just giving it visibility. I was very keen to know, um, so sustainability and on campus, you know, there's a rise in sort of activism on campus right now for various different reasons. Um, and I wondered how that's, you know, filtering in, particularly, I think, to the point around governance structures. Often um, I've heard, you know, having conversations at very many different sustainability events is that, you know, it, it's a person, it's an individual, it's one program, it's off to the side. And when that person goes or that person moves on, it loses its momentum. And so how do you maintain that sort of governance kind of structure? And then how do you have those grown up conversations on campus around societal good and what they should be doing and what the university should be doing and all the controversies that's happened there? So I wondered if you had a thought on some of that. So I will say that in the Modernizing Scholarship for the Public Good report, um, there are ways to think about how to more institutionalize some of this, some of this work. Some of those are, and it kind of depends too on um, what access you have uh, to influence at your institution, sort of what either your role is or your networks on a campus. Um, some of the things for the VPR, well, so for vice presidents of research, one thing they can do is think about catalytic, award, uh, catalytic awards, right? Or thinking about research grant challenges and ways to um, incentivize team science on their campus, right? Uh, and lots of institutions are doing that work. But they are not gonna work or they're not gonna touch things that have to do with promotion and tenure, right? Because that's the provost, that's the faculty affairs part of the house. So a little bit it's thinking about um, where you are in the institution. So, you know, if you're at a center for public engagement or you're in the vice president's uh, research office doing engagement, thinking about how you can build relationships align what you're doing to the institutional mission, finding champions at that level and giving, you know, like trying to bring as much as possible the president into the work that you're doing, right? Having them own some of that work is some things that I have seen uh, folks who are doing this work on campuses do. I think too, uh, one of the things that we encourage 
institutions or change agents on campus is, are there disciplinary society, is your disciplinary society or disciplinary society doing some of this work that you can encourage your researchers then to connect to? Is there a project like APARD or what ARL is doing if they have a funded project that you can um, bring people to the table at your institution because you're part of a national conversation or a national project. So we think about those sorts of things too. So I think there's not one way that you can try to more institutionalize this work, but it's looking at what your opportunities are at your campus, who is already bought in, what you might be able to tie your effort to, to tip at NSF, to go get money from there. If you can be part of a regional, uh, you know, a regional econ uh, economic engine, those sorts of things, or your institutional mission. So we think about, you know, just what are the leverage, leverage points you have. But this is, this is the issue that it is, we see time and time again, that you'll have a funded project and you'll get a lot of effort started. You'll build the partnerships. And then when there's turnover in leadership or the grant ends, in some ways, you know, those are, they might be maintained for a certain amount of time by like goodwill of the folks, but at some point you just can't keep relying on volunteer labor, right? And so thinking about more where you um, have some core funding for this work is, is a real challenge. I agree with you, okay. and uh, just to give an give an example of something that's ha like happening institutionally is the SDG 17 rooms university initiative, and that's mostly happening within universities where like faculties or uh, sustainability officers get into a room or of one to 17, all through the 17 SDGs and work on those related projects. So that's again finding like-minded folks who are interested in a topic and get the momentum going. Was part of your question about student activism, was that part of what you were getting I was, at? I was okay. avoiding that part. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I'm just going to answer that as a person, I think, but uh, you know, less so from an, as my association, although the values that we displayed included academic and intellectual freedom. I think there's huge opportunity um, to, for um, increased resources in dialogue, um, particularly dialogue across difference. I think this is what, I mean, I think this is the, what this moment is calling for. Um, and I want to, you know, absolutely celebrate our uh, keynote speakers, um, uh, you know, speaking out against um, censorship as the way to, and shutting down information as the way to get through um, difficult disagreement. So. Judy's braver than I am. <laughs> um, I'm an alum of Columbia University, so I have been. <laughs> Uh, each of you has spoken eloquently about the, the ecosystems that you're involved with. Do you have any wisdom for us? One of the issues with policy is when it's applied to an ecosystem, there are often lots of unintended consequences. Any thoughts, any wisdom you can share with us about maybe how to better anticipate what those might be, how to address them in ways that can make a policy successful? Arthur, are you, do you have in mind a certain I think it kind of depends on who you're speaking to and who is part of the ecosystem. So I th when I think about you know working with ARL and disciplinary societies, there's one way that we would try to uncover what our values are and the ways in which uh, we might have constituencies that we need to be aware of and kind of know, you know, what are the what are the way what what are the ways that we can move forward together and what are areas we need to avoid by knowing more about the kind of sectors or organizations we're working with. I think my response would be different and I don't know that I have a lot to offer if you're thinking about understanding politics and what's happening on the Hill. Because that's a very different kind of, I think, set of conversations. It's all about still building relationships and knowing what individuals value. But I don't do the lobbying side. So if you mean that side, I don't have a whole bunch to offer. But really thinking about the more the uh, national organizations and the ways that we work in alignment and partnership once it, with one another. We do lots of things here in DC where we'll have once a month conversations with some subsets of those like-minded organizations that are trying to understand what are you hearing on the Hill? What are you hearing from federal agencies? What are you hearing from your members? What are you seeing coming down that is from the lens of the organizational type that you sit within? You know, what are requests for information that are coming out and how do we, do we do joint letters together or individual letters? So there's a lot of that kind of sense making that happens um, here in DC and 
you know, a lot of it just getting to know the individuals who work at those organizations and then getting a dip, deeper sense of what their membership needs um, and their no-go areas and their, the places where they really have some exciting work going on. So, I don't know, it's just that building relationship. I, one of, uh, Elisa's, one of her favorite phrases that I have stolen is, um, progress only moves at the speed of trust. And so I think you have to have those kind of trusted relationships and honest conversations in ways that might not happen when we're sitting here at a panel, but that happen when we have conversations with one another. Yeah, I think it's absolutely about um, about those those kinds of relationships. I mean, ARL, we have a very small policy team. It's like two people. And so um, we do basically all of our policy work in, in coalition. And the coalitions aren't, um, it's not a bunch of groups that are all on this that agree with each other are all, you know, doing the same thing. That would we'd all be one organization if that were the case. So, um, those those kinds of engagements really surface, really, at least raise the um, opportunity for us to see um, what are the stakes for somebody else um, if this goes forward. And so, and then the relationships are what allows us to have a conversation that says you know, what, like help me understand this, <laughs> right? So um, that's thing, when we're at our best, I think that's what we're doing. One thing that, you know, I have been thinking about is how privileged and hidden curriculum, I don't, you know, the, mm -hmm. some of the language we'd use in education in these spaces and that there's not really good ways that we can externalize what we're learning and kind of the, um, and make more explicit or implicit knowledge as we have all of these conversations and put these mental models together. But um, I think we, we are trying to think about how we can externalize those uh, m uh, and be more explicit about that. That's one of the goals of the workshop that we're, we're planning, mm -hmm. to think about how can we think about in a more intentional way or more forcing each of us who are going to be in the room to think about who are the people that you have to make happy, you know, that you can't, you know, that you have to think about as you make any kind of decision. What are your strengths as an organization or sector? Um, what are your constraints? What is, what is the values of the, of the constituencies that are in your community? Those sorts of things to be more intentional about making those more, um, more explicit. So. I'm just thinking about what are the tools for change when you've got no resources, you know? <laughs> like, and, I, and I think, which is very much where, where I've found myself um, through pretty much every campaign, thinking, well, they've got the guns and the money. Um, and so what's kind of in my camp is knowledge in some way. And... I found the most powerful thing is some kind of tracker or um, way of publicly registering what performance and achievements and changes are taking place. Mm -hmm. You know, some, now obviously the extreme end of that is the league table. That worked brilliantly with all trials because if you were Merck and could see that GSK was, you know, had published 97% of its trials, um, it gave the lie to saying, well, we can't do that. Um, and, and immediately everyone fixated on that, saying, well, why are they ahead of us? But other ways, too, with transparency, you don't have to go in that direction. In transparency, we had more dashboardy type approaches, which just would enable government departments to say, why are they getting more greens than we are on the rag rating of our... You know, if there's something that... It enables people within organizations also to say, look, there are points to be gained externally. We don't want to be sitting at the bottom of this. Ideally, if you want to be soft about it, you can go beyond your sector so that collectively, as a sector, you are doing better than maybe other sectors or striving to. But I think, I wonder if it's worth having a think about some ways in which a publicly shown sort of descriptor like that, that would some way rank or track progress and enable you almost to mark up, you know, the wins in that. Do you see what I'm saying? It's whether it might be helpful um, to have some of those conversations that you, you want looking to have. And you are the people with the data, after all, <laughs> to produce these things. You know, I think there are some... One, tracking is hard and getting agreement about what should be tracked and then how can it be gamed? I do think we have some examples of where that's done. There's a Carnegie classification for engaged campuses. We have a IEP award, which is around, I don't know, economic engagement award. Um, you know, so and there's a little bit about how valid the criteria is set and like, is it a member association who's doing it versus an external body that is doing that work? I think, but even if an association does it, in which we might have, 
you know, certain, certain criteria. It's useful to give our member institutions an opportunity to shine, to just highlight them when they are doing good work and in the ways they are doing good work. So it's, it's sort of like, what problem are we trying to solve? I think, I think it's worth thinking about, but it's also, that's always the design is gonna be dependent on who's doing the, and what is the criteria, and for what purpose. But I think that's an interesting question that's worth thinking more intentionally about, so. I'd like to add that this is somewhat going in sector-wise. Like I, I mentioned the AC stars, where they rank institutions in terms of the sustainability, what's going on at universities. But again, it's one sector of sustainability, and again, every university gets points for what are the, what are the initiatives on campus or what are the programs they have, re everything related to sustainability, and that's really helped in... Uh, incentivizing universities to get go up in over the ladder and get get the higher ranking and likewise that's happened in uh, like other there are uh, other organizations that do it like the times higher ed and uh, i'd like to highlight one report that we did uh, as the sdg publishers compact like uh, they worked on it was a joint task force on outcomes and impacts and where they worked with these assessment organizations to see, like, to go away from outputs rather than, and focus more on outcomes. So that's a report that I would suggest yeah. reading. Outcomes are so hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think this is an uh, aspirational answer, but um, I do think that sort of as we um, broaden, modernize our look of scholarship and, and think about, you know, different kinds of outputs, um, and their findability and their sort of integration into d whatever discovery environment people are using. I think there's there's work there's interesting and exciting work to be done there, but it's um, very hard. <laughs> I don't presume that you know the panels will know um, or be able to speak to funding, but it seems to me that the way higher education is paying for research is deeply problematic, and that the library, the press, the research, the funders, all the, the way it's done is very, um, you know, 1920s, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, um, and it's just really not serving, I think, our community well or science very well. And so we're all going to hire it to pay for the journals, to pay for the research, to pay for, to be engaged, to be impactful. Yet the, the funding is just really not, it's just backwards, and some units are under p and pressure, some are not, some's common good, some isn't, but at the end of the day, higher ed is really about elevating minds and having an impact on our society. So I don't know from your viewpoint if you have an opinion on that and how, you know, what that means for all of us <laughs> sitting here contemplating SDGs and, and how we can have an impact on our society. I would like to say that um, in the Compact Fellows, we talk about this on how we can get research to practitioners or whether, like, how is the research really, uh, like, is, how can it impact on the ground, the, or the people who are actually working on the field and the, which are the practitioners. Uh, so I would say, like, if we fund such research, and it's not that I'm going towards applied research only or I'm recommending for that, like, basic research does uh, in, uh, inform applied research, but uh, I feel that kind of research that in, impacts practitioners uh, and funding that would really help. And yeah, if uh, if we revisit the funding model, it would be really helpful. I agree with you. I mean, I think one one of the this isn't this isn't directly answer your question, but I think one of the issues around higher education's funding um, is partially addressed by, or at least there's an opportunity to address, um, you know, sort of the issues around default, you know, withdrawal of public funds from, from higher education with this kind of engagement. I mean, I think that's part of the value proposition of trying to engage the public, trying to demonstrate to the community what, um, you know, what, uh, how the, how, how the, uni how university research is making society better, healthier, whatever. So, um, I mean, I think there's, yeah. Best answer. <laughs> this one I'm not touching again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, hi, Benjamin on the ground at the Pew Charitable Trust. So I just wanted to respond directly because we've convened a network uh, called the Transforming Evidence Funders Network of about 80 uh, philanthropies and funding organizations around exactly the questions that are being asked today. So our, we've taken a great deal of inspiration from Casey and, and APLU's work. Pew has been funding engaged scholarship for a number of years um, through the Lenfest Ocean Program in uh, ocean and coastal conservation. We have found funders around the world who have been doing similar co-productive approaches in a number of different fields and have come together really to first learn from each other and ask um, deep questions about what are the ways that we can structure grant making better to support this type of work, but also how can funders collective voice and cross-disciplinary voice play a role in advancing the field as a whole. So I've, I've learned a lot here that I'll be taking back to that group, but also um, you know, some of what we're doing with, with the workshop with APLU. We've supported the National Academies meeting in June. We've started to work with Penn State University to convene um, senior university leaders, presidents, and chancellors to ask really deep questions around um, what, the, what success looks like in this space, um, what uh, innovative metrics for impacts look like at scale, and how we can play a, a more significant role in, in pushing some of that forward. So just a, a quick response, because it's come up a couple times today, to say that um, we're really excited about what we can do to provide a table for many, many funders around the, around the world who are interested in exactly these questions. Thank you for participating today. We love to hear from outside our own publishing bubble as often as we can. Thank you very much for joining us.